Let's begin by looking at the type-based properties. The CSS properties used to style text generally fall into two categories. Font styles, which are the properties that affect the text such as which font gets applied, its size, and whether it's bold or italic. Then we have text layout styles. These are the properties that affect the spacing and the other layout features of the text allowing manipulation of, for example, the space between lines and letters and how the text is aligned within the content box. Let's start off by looking at the font style properties. If you've ever used word processing software like Microsoft Word or Google Docs, chances are that you're probably used to the features that allow you to change and control a variety of aspects about the font that you're using. On the web, we have the ability to control the following properties using CSS. We can control the font family property, which specifies a prioritized list of one or more font family names and or generic family names for a selected element. We have font size properties, which allow us to set the size of the font. We have font stretch properties, which allow us to select a normal, condensed or expanded font face from a font. We have font style properties, which allow us to specify whether a font should be styled with normal, italic, or oblique face from its font family. We have font variant properties, which is used to convert all lowercase letters to all uppercase letters. We have some ways to adjust how the converted uppercase letters will appear, so we'll look into this as well. Then we have the font weight property, which allows us to set the weight or boldness of the font. And finally, we have the line height property, which allows us to set the height of a line box or the letting. Let's move straight on into looking at the properties for styling fonts on the web. We'll apply some CSS properties to this following HTML text-based example. Here's the HTML that I've already created. We have a heading, a block quote, some paragraphs, and a list. We'll use some of the font-based properties to adjust how the text is going to look. I'll go into my external style sheet. Currently, I have a declaration for the font family property. This allows you to specify a font or a list of fonts for the browser to apply to the selected elements. Currently, the font family is set to the sans serif. This is the generic sans serif that is located on my particular machine. When we use the keyword font families, it will go ahead and pick whatever the default font family is for that particular style. We can be more specific by adding a different font in front of this one. So if I request Arial and then I put a comma, what I'm saying now is my first choice is Arial if that is not available, please resolve to whatever sans serif is installed on my machine. When I refresh right now, you'll see that the font doesn't change. And that's because currently Ariel is probably my default sans serif. Let's go ahead and let's increase our font stack so that we have a different font set as the first choice. Now I'm specifying Verdana as my first choice. Ariel as the second, and then defaulting to the default sans serif. If I reload my page now, you can see that the font family has changed. So now my page is rendering out with Verdana font, since this is my first choice. CSS defines five generic names for fonts. Those are the serif, sans serif, monospace, cursive, and fantasy. These are the generic font faces that are used for these categories. The actual font that is displayed can vary between browser and operating system. It represents a worst case scenario where the browser will try its best to provide a font that looks appropriate. It is more practical to create a font stack. The font stack is where you start with your first choice, you provide some similar alternatives, and then you always end with the generic font face family. That at least gets the users in the right stylistic ballpark. If you want a pretty safe choice, then it's wise to choose a font that is deemed web safe. Web safe fonts are fonts that are pre-installed on most devices. 
That means that these fonts will most likely be able to display on any browser and on any device. When we use these web safe fonts, web designers and developers can ensure that the intended font will always be displayed properly on a web page. But for some reason, if the specified font is not installed, if the user has manually uninstalled the font, which is highly unlikely, well, that's when our font stack comes into play. We always want to use the font stack where we make our first and possibly second and third choice and then always end the font stack with the generic font family like serif or sans serif. When setting typefaces on a web page, keep the following points in mind. The font specified must be installed on the user's computer or downloaded with the site. WebSafe fonts are groups of fonts supported across most browsers and operating systems. Unless you are using WebSafe fonts, the font you choose may not appear the same between all browsers and operating systems. When the name of the typeface consists of one or more word, it's best practice to enclose the typeface name in quotes like this, Arial Black. Let's return to our web page and add some other font-based properties. Now that I've specified the overall font family for my page, all of the elements on my page have transformed to this font. Let's make a rule for our block quote element and let's have this display with a different font family. I'm going to request Georgia, and if Georgia isn't available, I'll just resolve to the default serif font. I'm also going to set the font style to italic. This will force the font to render as italic text. If we refresh our page now, you can see that the block quote element has now changed and is now appearing using our serif italic font. I'll go ahead and make some additional rules. I'm going to make a rule on my H1 and I'm going to set the font size. When you specify font size, you can use a variety of units. Some of the more commonly used units will be pixels or you may be using M's or REMs. We did discuss M's and REMs in a previous lesson. One M is equal to the font size set on the parent element of the current element we are styling. This happens to be the width of a capital letter M contained inside the parent element. So if I go ahead and make a rule on my paragraphs and I set the font size to 1M and we save, you'll see that no change is going to occur. And that's because the default font size on my page is set to 16 pixels. So 1M is equal to 16 pixels. If I want my paragraphs to be 15 pixels, but I want to use M's, I would need to divide 15 into 16 and whatever that value is, in this case it would be 0.9375 and I would specify M's. This is going to give me a paragraph size of 15 pixels, but I'm using the font size of M, which is a relative unit. REMs work just like M's, except they're always equal to the root element of the document. This would be the HTML element and not the parent that the element is enclosed in. As you can see on my web page, the parent of the paragraphs is currently a section element. Let me just show you what happens if we make a paragraph element and place it outside of the section. If we refresh our page in the browser, you can see that all of the paragraphs are the same size. However, if we go into our CSS, and if I make a rule on the section element, and we set the font size on the section element to 20 pixels, if we refresh our page, you will see that the paragraph that is outside of the section is going to be smaller. This is rendering at 15 pixels. The rest of the paragraph text is now using a base font size of 20 pixels. So if we multiplied our 0.9375 by 20, that gives us a paragraph font size that is now equal to 18.75 pixels. If, however, we change the unit of measurement from M's to REM's and we save our page, Notice what happens to the paragraphs. 
they all go back to the smaller font size. Now they are rendering out at the 15 pixels because rem is tied to the root font size, which in this case is our HTML parent element. What I like to do when you're working with the relative units, which are the M's and the REMs, is I like to go ahead and define a rule on my HTML element and set the font size to 10 pixels. This is going to go ahead and ensure that the base font size has now been changed to 10 pixels instead of 16 pixels. Now the elements that are tied to the REM unit of measurement will all shrink. The reason I'm using 10 is because now the math is much easier. If I want my paragraph font size to be 15 pixels, or the equivalent thereof, all I have to do now is write the rem unit of measurement as a decimal, so 15 pixels is equal to 1.5. If I wanted my h1s to use rems, I would now specify 4 rems. As you can see, this is much easier in regards to the math rather than trying to figure it out based on a 16 pixel base font size. I'm going to get rid of the font size of 20 pixels on the section element. We'll refresh our page. As you can see, since I did not specify the font size on the block quote or the UL, they are appearing much smaller. Let's adjust that now. We'll make the block quote 1.8 rems and let's set our unordered list to 1.5 rems. Now if we refresh our page, all of our font sizes are styled in the way that we want. Except for my H2. Let me go ahead and specify that the H2 is set to 30 pixels or 3 rems. That looks good. Now I'm going to take my H2 and instead of having it render as bold as it normally does, I'm going to specify that the font weight be normal. This will remove the boldness from the H2 element and now it renders out at a normal font weight. Font weight will take the values of normal or bold there are some fonts that allow you to apply a numeric boldness factor and you will have finer grained control to the fonts. We will work with those at a later time. Let me show you what the text transform property will do to your elements. I'm going to apply text transform to my H2 element. Text transform allows the font to be transformed to uppercase, lowercase, or capitalize. If I put the value here at uppercase and we save, if you look now, my H2 element is completely uppercase. I'm going to come to my H1 and we're going to use text transform and we'll specify lowercase. If we do this, you'll see that my H1 heading is no longer for rems. Do you see where the problem lies? I don't have a semicolon on this declaration. So what's happening is both the font size and the text transform are being ignored. Let's add the semicolon, save our page, and refresh. Now you can see that all of the text in this sentence is lowercase. If we make the text transform value set to capitalize, then every first letter for each word in the sentence is going to be capitalized. Having the ability to transform the text is very handy using CSS. Let's go into our HTML and I'm going to apply a class to my first paragraph. We're going to assign a class name of small caps. If I go back to my CSS, let's make a rule for the small caps paragraph. I'm going to use my font variant property and we're going to set this to small caps. If I save my page and you watch the first paragraph, when I click refresh, you can see how it's changed all of the words to capitals, but every single word that was a capital letter remains capitalized. Every other letter that was lowercase is small caps. So with the font variant, 
we can pass on the property of small cap or if we needed to overwrite that at some point we could use the default value of normal the font stretch property will allow you to either specify normal condensed or an expanded face from a font if those styles exist in the font currently none of the fonts that we're using on our page support that but I will show you this later when we add a font that does support this sort of behavior let's look at line height I'm going to apply line height to my block quote element I'll add the property of line height and we are going to pass in a numeric value so let's go ahead and pass in a line height of 1.6 this acts as a ratio so it takes the font size and multiplies that by this value if we refresh you can see how the line height or the letting has now increased on our block quote element I find that I generally use font size font weight font style and line height on many of my projects text transform and font variant can be useful in certain situations but you may not use them as much as the others that I mentioned the final thing that I want to show you in regards to the font properties that we've talked about is the fact that you can use font shorthand property shorthand properties are CSS properties that let you set the values of multiple CSS properties simultaneously using a shorthand property can be more concise and often more readable in your style sheets when we use the font shorthand we need to specify the following font properties in the following order font style font variant font weight font stretch font size line height and font family among the properties that I just mentioned only font size and font family are required when using the font shorthand property the other properties are optional you'll also need to specify a forward slash between the font size and the line height properties let's look at an example of how we can use the font shorthand I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to combine all of the properties that we specified within our block quote selector into the font shorthand so what we'll do here is we'll comment out the current properties that we had created in order to use the font shorthand I'll start off by specifying the font style then I'm going to put a space and since I'm not using font variant font weight or font stretch I'll ignore those properties we'll go ahead and specify our font size which is 1.8 rems we'll use a forward slash and add our line height which is 1.6 and then we'll specify out our font family so I'm using Georgia comma serif now I'll use the semicolon and if we save our page and refresh you can see that nothing has changed within the block quote area all of the text has remained the same so this one line of code has now done the same thing as these four lines of code you can see that using the font shorthand is much more concise and easier to read just remember when you use font shorthand you need to make sure that you're specifying the properties in the particular order in which they need to be expected and if you're using both font size and line height you separate them with the forward slash any of the properties that you don't specify in the font shorthand are just ignored and they keep their default values that does it for our font based properties we'll continue to learn about other things that we can do to text using alternate properties